Muslims claim that the Dome of the Rock was built in the 7th century, but historical records gathered by A.G. Deuce sure tell a different story. We'll lay it all out so that you can draw your own conclusions. So come and see. This is the conclusion of this uh, wonderful series that we're doing with Mel concerning the dating of the inscriptions at the Dome of the Rock. And today we can call it mystery solved as we will explore uh, the final evidence to support at least A.J. Deuce's position. Again, we are presenting to you evidence from uh, this article written by A.J. Deuce. That doesn't mean in any way we are denying maybe there are other evidence that might exist. We welcome, actually, uh, this healthy debate. And if we can uncover more stuff related to this, we'll be the first to bring it, uh, bring it up here and uh, deal with it as well. So we're not dogmatic about it. We just wanted to point out that there are controversy concerning the dates. And also, it confirms what we've been preaching all along. There are so many discrepancies when it comes to the standard Islamic narrative concerning almost everything related to that. With that in mind, I want to welcome Mel, and uh, thank you for, of course, taking the time to be here with us. My pleasure, and uh, looking forward to sharing what I've got from AJ Juice's paper today. So we're going to wrap up um, our uh, discussion of his paper. We're going to be looking at the major changes to the Dome of the Rock and also solving the, the mystery around when the various inscriptions were put in place in the Dome of the Rock, at least, as you say, according to AJ Juice. So. We start with um, a couple of images of the Dome of the Rock. Uh, the, the one on the, on the left um, is from 1410, 1426, and you see it's quite different. There's a, a raised um, part underneath the dome itself, and also the dome looks more like an onion shape. Same with the image on the right, uh, 1483. Uh, it's very pointy on the top. Um, if we go to... The next slide here, um, A.J. Juice uh, says that just a little later, the German Felix Fabry is able to visit the Dome of the Rock. That he does not see or recognize an Arab inscription is made clear by his attribution of the original structure to Umar. Also from the end of the 15th century, uh, Mujir ed Dean writes that the interior and exterior walls of the Dome of the Rock were decorated with colorful mosaics, even up high, but like Fabry before, he neither gives us the builder nor the inscriptions. Then we see the very first sign that new, new mosaics are in the dome. This is a pilgrimage certificate from 1544, 1545, which, is, which shows a layout of the Haram al-Sharif with the Dome of the Rock covering the foundation stone. Um, this is not meant to represent exactly the Dome of the Rock by any stretch of the imagination, but it is reminiscent, even though uh, it's reminiscent of the mosaics in the Dome of the Rock without um, having the same colour. Um, so it's the first um, indication that there are new mosaics in the Dome of the Rock. Uh, in 1528, there is an inscription that prays for Suleiman. Um, the reason for this is because there was work done in the Dome of the Rock at that time. Stated to, as I say, 1528, it's if authentic, then internal and external renovations must be ongoing. Crucially, Suleiman had extensive interior renovations done in the Dome of the Rock in 1523 to 1543, which is directly just before that certificate that we saw there. So that's interesting. Now, if we take a look of the, at the mausoleum of Suleiman from 1566, we can see it's clearly inspired by the Dome of the Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, we also can see that there are remarkable similarities between the style of the Dome of the Rock mosaics and contemporary mausoleums. So on the far left is the Dome of the Rock. In the middle is a mosaic from Suleiman's mausoleum. And on the right is Selim II's tomb. And you can see it's very similar. It's not exactly the same, obviously, but similar level of artist artistry. Um, and A.J. Juice says, this is different with exterior tile work at the tomb of Selim II. Here we have a direct stylistic relationship to the figures in the Dome of the Rock. So he's saying it's not just that it's a similar artistic style. 
the motifs are very similar. There is a direct relationship, which would indicate that what's in the Dome of the Rock is contemporary with the other one, which is in the in the tomb of Selim II. Um, 1526, still Umar is thought of as the builder. Sebastian Munster in 1526 attributes the Dome of the Rock to Umar, which is odd considering if there is an inscription inside, surely it would have said either Abdul al-Malik or al-Mamun. Um, and uh, here we have uh, an image of what the Dome of the Rock looked like in 1576. So as you can see, it's not quite the way it is today. Um, we also he here have a reference to the Dome of the Rock being closed to Christians. Uh, Fiennes Morrison reports on his 10-year travels after it, expressing his horror about the circumstances of Jerusalem, which he visited. The book contains an expansive description of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Uh, and he basically says that, um, let me read it to you, in this class, in this large circuit, compassed all with walls of old, the Temple of Solomon stood. At this day, it was overgrown with grass, and in the midst thereof, the Turks had a mosque for their wicked worship of Muhammad. Neither may any Christian come within this, this circuit, much less into the mosque, either being a capital offence, which they say some curious Christians had tried with loss of life after they had been drawn to enter it by some Turks' vain promises. So I wonder why they're trying to keep the Christians from nosing about inside, especially considering there's inscriptions that's meant to be directed towards Christians. So you'd imagine they would want Christians to read the inscription. Also, in 1596, there is a book published that claims Umar built the Dome of the Rock. Um, so this is a book by uh, Signor Jacques de Villemont. And uh, as it says, the structure stands as Umar had built it. This is what he was told. Again in 1608, Jean Valar, the custodian of the Holy Sepulchre, delivers a 700-page overview of Jerusalem, its environments and sites, he claims it was built by Umar as well. Now, we have to imagine that these people, um, particularly uh, Jean Valer, who's the custodian of the Holy Sepulchre, and he, he should be well informed. If there was an inscription saying Abdul al-Malik built it, why would he be going around thinking it was built by Umar, unless there was no inscription yet there? Um, 1609, a Muslim reports that the interior was mostly all white. So there, there must have been uh, more work being done inside it. So whatever they did um, earlier, um, it's, it's been updated. In 1620, an Italian Bernardino Amico publishes a book, and in it he reports the presence of a dedicatory inscription that says, Umer built the Dome of the Rock. So this is a different inscription to the one that we think of today being Abdul al-Malik. Yeah, so, so which Omar are we talking about here? Ibn al-Khattab? Yes, yeah. yeah so and it, this, and it, he, is this in relationship to what you and I covered in the past, that the possibility that this Omar is actually a Christian? Uh, yes, yeah. It, it So it could be that this building wasn't even meant to be Muslim to begin with. Got it. Um, now, the building that he, he built was um, uh, destroyed and it was rebuilt multiple times, and we have evidence of that in the 7th century. So whatever idea they got that um, Umar built the Dome of the Rock, that's clearly false. Um, so, But yes, this idea has survived up to 1620, and it contradicts the idea that there was an inscription that said um, otherwise. Um, now, here we just have an indication that the, the Dome of the Rock still has an octagonal uh, drum underneath it. Okay, the drum that exists today is um, circular. So that, um, I would suggest, would mean that everything under the, the dome that, that's there is all new. So if there's any inscriptions there, this is separate now from the arcade, that would all be new stuff. Um, now, we also have the following here. Um, A.J. Juice says that given the pilgrimage certificate from 1544, the Jewish serpent king, which is a particular design inside the Dome of the Rock, 
uh, on the interior octagonal find their origin then between 1523 and 1543. The inscription is from the same time, but it must have sported Umar. He says that Abdul al-Malik's dedication is a likely cover-up executed between 1720 and 1744 that must have replaced the dedication by Umar from the Serpent King. Al-Mamun's correction is from the 18th or 19th century. Now, I've, I've cut out an awful lot of the evidence just to, to, um, to make this a little bit briefer for everyone. And if you want to look at the wider evidence in A.J. Juice's paper, you'll see why he argues that case. Um, we see here in 1804 a view of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, and you can see that the drum is round, but the cupola on top is not quite round yet. Um, this is um, an indication that the the Dome of the Rock, the actual dome of the Dome of the Rock, is built after 1804. It's been changed dramatically. Now, it's in... 1833 that we see that the Dome of the Rock looks pretty much like it is today. Mm -hmm. So um, A.J. Juice says that a major restoration is undertaken under Sultan Mahmoud II in 1817. The marble of the exterior of the building is restored and a portico over the South Qibla entrance is built. Another significant change to the structure appears to have occurred, the cupola. Drawings with mosaics of the dome were made by Frederick Catterwood in 1833. His drawings include an outside view and a cross-section together with a layout of the mosaics in question. This is the first primary evidence that mosaics on the drum exist. Okay. Um, this is, again, this is not to be confused with the, um, the arcades, the one with the 22-meter inscription. The mosaics in the drum and Alma Moon's correction originate in 1817 and were completed before 1833 on the basis of this evidence, according to A.J. Juice. Here's a photograph from 1862, and you can see the exterior tile work was mainly missing. So all of the beautiful tile work that we see outside the Dome of the Rock, maybe many Muslims are convinced that this has existed from the time of Abdul al-Malik. Well, clearly it didn't. Um, so that it's, again, this is more evidence for a lot of changes to the Dome of the Rock over the centuries. And so to summarize, this is A.J. Juice's case. He says our earliest reference to a Dome of the Rock, i.e. a dome over the Temple Mount Foundation Rock is in the late ninth century. Our earliest verifiable witness to the Dome of the Rock mosaics and the interior arcade inscriptions as they exist today is 1523 to 1543. The earliest witness inscription as to who built the dome was from 1523, 1543, and it said Umar built it. The earliest verifiable date for the creation of the Abdul al-Malik inscription is 1720, 1744, so not too long ago, really. Uh, a complete rebuilding of the drum from the ground up, from octagonal to circular, happened in the mid-18th century. And the drum, again, is the, the part that is underneath the dome itself, which would mean, obviously, the dome cannot be older than the drum underneath it. Uh, number six, the mosaics and inscriptions on the drum and the dome are 18th century creations. So we're talking 18th century AD, just to be clear. And then finally, the earliest verifiable date for the creation of the Alma Moon correction is sometime between... 1817 and 1833. So I'll come back to you now. Yep, that's wonderful. And I'm glad you summarized the, all of this uh, concerning these holes. And uh, I guess all we can discern uh, from, from all of this is that uh, things as we see them today did not just happen in the seventh century. There was an evolution of some sort, step-by-step -step restoration, inscriptions, discoveries, writings, you name it. And uh, what we see today uh, was the result of that, not the other way around, meaning it didn't exist like that since the seventh century. So that alone should really prompt our Muslim friends to examine the evidence one more time and then recheck the history because it seemed like the standard Islamic narrative yet again have proven to be shaky and it has nothing really 
uh, to offer uh, that is of significance, if you wish. And then it, it, this points really uh, to what I mentioned in one of the episodes uh, previously to you, that it appears that the Ottoman Empire is responsible for many of the stuff that we see today. Absolutely. Um, a number of researches I've done seem to suggest even that the Hadiths, at least some of the Hadiths, seem to be produced in Ottoman times. So um, this should be no surprise. And the strange thing is no one picked up on it until very recently. Um, and so I would say, um, just say to everyone who is watching, this is not the final word. This is not um, categorical. Um, I'm hoping that people will challenge this case by AJ Juice, because that way we'll get to the, the bottom of all of this. We'll get to the, the full truth. We'll be able to figure out what is dependable, what is solid evidence, what isn't. Um, where did AJ Juice exaggerate? Where did he get it spot on? But as it stands as, as of today, I, I would say that I'm very um, impressed by the evidence. And I would be inclined to think that the inscriptions are too perfect, too, um, uh, what's the word? They're without any blemishes um, yeah. for that to be from the 7th century. I had a look at the mosaics in the Cordoba mosque. And actually, just on my channel today, I, I put a picture of the, in, the uh, inscriptions from uh, the Dome of the Rock. And I had an image of the mosaics from Cor Cordoba. And I asked people without telling them which was which, which did they think was older and which did they think was younger. And it was interesting that they thought the, the one from Cordoba was clearly older. It was a majority, I think it was like 90% thought the Cordoba one looked older. And yet we're to believe that the mosaics and inscriptions are three centuries older than the ones in Cordoba. The ones in Cordoba have got bits of tile that have broken off, bits that got damaged over the centuries. That's what you would typically get if you have something in place for um, centuries and centuries. But inside in the Dome of the Rock, there is no damage. There's nothing. All, everything is seemingly perfect. That's a little bit hard to believe. Even if AJ Juice gets it wrong on some points, I think those who... who want to make a positive case for these inscriptions being from the 7th century. I think you will need to give a good argument why the inscriptions seem to be so perfect, at least in terms of appearance. There are problems with the, the inscriptions, which I haven't covered, in particular with the Arabic itself, um, and that may be something to come back to at a later stage. There are suggestions that the, um, the style of writing while it's Kufic, isn't uh, necessarily the type of Kufic that comes from the 7th century. It looks more like um, the 9th century, which would be a problem and would be more consistent with someone trying to mimic Kufic script and getting it wrong rather than it being from the 7th century. But that would be something to come back to uh, maybe at another time. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, uh, if, if I may ask, I mean, uh, who's A.J. Deuce? I mean, there's something just for our audience uh, to know. Um, uh, does he mention that in his own article, for instance, his background? Um, he's, he's uh, I think his background is in, uh, in, in relation to, I think it was Middle East studies, that kind of area. Um, I, I, I don't remember the, the full bio. Um, He's just someone who's very interested in this whole area and he's kind of a bit like myself. He's a, a researcher and uh, has been at this for a long time, 20 years. I don't know who's his, his real name or anything like that. I don't know where he's located. I've had uh, multiple discussions with him by email and uh, he he's not afraid to um, challenge the standard Islamic narrative and that's one of the aspects of him which I find really refreshing. Um, some people might feel that he goes too far and that he he goes out too far on a limb with, with his ideas, but I think it's good to question things. Um, we're pushing against a status quo that's been in place for centuries and centuries. So, you know, I'd rather we ask too many questions than ask too few questions. And I'd rather, you know, we, we make a mess. We may get some things wrong, but that's okay as long as we're asking the questions eventually we're 
we're going to get at the truth eventually. And uh, I think every time we delve into things, we get closer to the full truth. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's that's all I know really about him. And I, I, I maybe um, I'll look into his background a bit further, but he's quite private, I think, about his about himself. And and uh, again, uh, I think you changed the name of your channel. Is is that true? Yeah, um, yeah. So I renamed my channel to Origins um, a few weeks ago. Um, that was to reflect really the the subject matter that I'm more focused on. It was originally called Sneakers Corner. Correct. And that was because when I originally started, I was interested in what was happening at Speakers Corner, and it was a pun on the word. Uh, speakers corner. I thought I'd change it to sneakers because of the fact that the uh, the Daoists in speakers corner at the time had a tendency to run away whenever they were challenged. So it was just a joke on that. The idea that they were uh, running in their sneakers away from the uh, the Christians that were there asking awkward questions. I thought that was a an amusing um, title to give my channel. So um, Origins of Islam is really the focus from here on in, and that's why I've, I changed it to Origins. And if if anyone has been confused by that, well, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to find me on YouTube now. Yeah, I mean, I did receive some panic messages from people uh, uh, asking about your channel, so I really didn't know what to say, and I was hoping that uh, nothing really happened to where it was taken down. Uh, I just hoped that it was just an idea of reconstructing it, maybe. And, and yeah. uh, it's, it appears that's the case. Um, in the next minute or so, what's in the works uh, lately beside this? Uh, is there anything else you're working on? And you don't have to share details, of course, but just give us an overview. Yeah. So um, just to wrap up before the summer, what I'm planning to do is look at the um, all the different fake things, fake artifacts associated with Islam. So things like Abraham's footmark and things like that and okay. Muhammad's hair and all the crazy 70 foot long tombs and things like that. I think that would be quite fun. I might do a top 20 on those. Yeah, and um, I'll be really interested myself in the uh, footprint of Abraham because it is in the Kaaba, of course, and I've seen it with my own eyes. So uh, it'll be good for us to uh, discuss that. Yeah, it reminds me of um, two baking tins. You know, if you make a, two loaves of bread, <laughs> yeah, I think I don't think in terms of an artifact, I, do, I don't think they, they put a lot of effort into making it look convincing. But uh, there we go. Yeah. Well, again, thank you so much, brother. And uh, this was an interesting, of course, wrap up to uh, this series. And uh, uh, again, people might, you know, if we can fit it into the podcast, they might hear it also in the podcast as well. But uh, thank you again for this wonderful work. You and I will be in touch, of course, as always. And we will continue doing live streams and again, doing these kind of shows. Uh, so uh, we thank you, brother, for taking the time. And uh, hopefully uh, everyone will be able to uh, subscribe to your channel and, uh, of course, follow the work that you are doing. Uh, these type of research are extremely essential and important, and they are eye-opener uh, at all levels. All right. Take care, guys. This is Al-Fadi. Over and out. God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.